the movement for unity was propelled by a movement that was known as a risorgimento or literally resurgence. This started in course of the early 19th century, indeed from the beginning of the 19th century, but more specifically after 1815. There were a number of factors that helped the formation of this Risorgimento movement or what has sometimes also been called a, the liberal movement in Italy. At the turn of the 19th century, nearly two-thirds of the Italians were living under direct or indirect rule of Napoleon. We had seen earlier the conquest of virtually the whole of Italy by Napoleon, its reorganization first into republics and then into uh, monarchies. Napoleon placed his people, his own brothers, cousins and associates on the thrones that he created there. In two ways did Napoleonic rule allow the Italians to consider themselves as Italians. On the one hand, Napoleon introduced the reforms of the revolution. The Code Napoleon, the attack on the feudal institutions. Now all this ushered in, even if very slowly and gradually, elements of modernity into Italy. On the other hand, the imposition of the Napoleonic rule was seen as a foreign rule. And thereby, there was the construction of the other. And in the construction of this other of the foreign or French rule, the Italians began to consider themselves as a people living under alien rule. Leopardi had summed this up when he wrote that how unfortunate is a person who dies in another country fighting for another country. He was obviously referring to the Italian soldiers in Napoleon's Grand Army who fought and died in Spain and other parts. The Italian historians later tried to play down the role of the Napoleonic rule in Italy. But it is a fact of history that the Italians started to think of themselves as a nation in the modern period thanks largely to the impact of the French rule. A second factor was the character of the restored monarchies after 1815. When Napoleon was finally defeated, the Congress of Vienna restored the former rulers to their kingdoms. Only Marie-Louise, uh, Napoleon's wife and the Princess of Austria, was placed as a ruler of Parma. In most of these states, the rulers started by giving some kind of a constitution or at least preserving some of the Napoleonic reforms. The reforms that they introduced or the kind of regime that they established uh, had a ring of familiarity with a paternalism that was popular in the age of enlightened despotism. Nevertheless, it did introduce some reforms in Piedmont, in, in even Naples, in Modena, Tuscany, in, in Parma. In Parma, Marie Louise retained many of the Napoleonic uh, people. The same is true of uh, other areas, including even Naples and Sicily. Even in Austrian rule Lombardy and Venetia, the sale of the Bien Nacierno, the confiscated property, had been confirmed. And needless to say, the beneficiary of this uh, sale of the confiscated properties had been people who were thus committed to the new regime. Some of the best men were of the Napoleonic period were uh, kept. Piedmont was dominated by the old privileged classes. 
Genoa was acquired by Piedmont in 1815 when Mazzini was only 10 years old. The merchants of Genoa bitterly resented this takeover by Piedmont. They were still very deeply attached to the old republican institutions and this nostalgia of the republic was to be a major element in one strand of the Risorgimento which was laid by Mazzini in course of the 19th century. Now Sardinia Piedmont which was ruled by the house of Savoy became a very crucial state in the future history of Italy. It was in 1720 that the Duke of Savoy uh, acquired Sardinia and was permitted by other European monarchs to be a king, to be called the king of Sardinia. Now one uh, ruler of this dynasty had propagated what came to be known as the artichoke theory. He said that he would uh, peel off the different states of Italy like the uh, uh, layers of an artichoke and thus under the leadership of Sardinia unify uh, the whole of Italy. A third factor that uh, was an element of the Risorgimento and helped forge the liberal movement was an appeal to the great past of Italy. Italy or Rome was the seat of the great Roman Empire. Rome was the seat of the papacy. Now, in a way, there was a great appeal to the unique and glorious past of Italy, which also distinguished Italy from other nations. So those who were trying to visualize Italy as a united nation, united state necessarily appealed to the past to legitimize their vision, to legitimize their quest for both unity and independence. There were a number of secret societies in, in Italy emerging at this time. Now, this kind of secret societies characterized European politics both on the left and the right from the late 18th century. From Freemasons and, and others, we had referred to some of them while reading the French Revolution. Now, here again, the secret societies became uh, a significant part of the political activity during the first half of the 19th century. The most significant of these in Italy was the Carbonari. Now, the secret society movements uh, created a following who we, which attempted to both secure a constitutional regime, to drive the Austrians out of Italy, and, and thus recreate new regimes generally. They were fairly influential in Naples, Sicily, and the Papal States. But very soon it was clear that these secret societies did not have the kind of mass following that was a sine qua non for a successful political movement. They also did not have a coherent set of ideology and an organized view of the future. As a, as a result, they were very soon reduced to ineffectiveness, though one must say that they continued to influence many important people who would emerge as leaders in the future. Buonarroti, a Tuscan radical who had adopted French citizenship in the 1790s, was one of those people who now tried to talk in a new language of popular sovereignty. Now, this cultural movement was essential uh, part of the Risorgimento. There was an appeal, of course, here again to the Italian, Italian past. But what is significant is that some people were now beginning to assume an all-Italian perspective, that not to think or speak in terms of the regions into which Italy was apparently hopelessly divided, but to visualize and project an image of a unified Italy. And it is to this past that they appealed. 
the vehicle through which the cultural movement emerged was poetry, novels, literature generally speaking, even history and, and uh, intellectual, other kind of intellectual activities. In the years after 1815, Hugo Foscolo was a very significant poet and he was known to all Italians who traveled beyond their regions. Pietro Giordani wrote in 1816, I'm quoting him, quote, Occasionally we use the word Italy, but it finds no echo in people's hearts, unquote. In Milan, Confello Niori, Bechet and Pellico uh, published a conciliatore, which called for cultural and economic awakening in Lombardy. In Florence, there was the old uh, bookseller Vioso, who produced an anthologia in a collaboration with uh, Tomasio the philologist and Caponi the Tuscan historian. The anthologia propagated ideas of moderate liberalism. Their ideas helped the formation of the concepts of concepts which were more national than local. History was the handmaiden in a way of the intellectual risorgimento. Cantu and Troy were historians. Massimo Dazzeglio and Guerazzi wrote great historical novels. And they, these all recall the glories of Italy and also underlined the relevance of the past to the making of the present. Industrial and uh, mercantile capitalism was coming in very slowly, but it was coming. This led to the emergence of a bourgeoisie in certain regions, particularly in the northern parts of Italy. And these people would have wanted the introduction and expansion of railways, the communication to be better, and an integration of Italy as a market. Anyone who produced something, including peasants, who produced a surplus that could be exported, were interested in this. Now, this economic development favored the growth of political liberalism as well, because liberalism, in a way, was the political creed of the emerging capitalism in the early 19th century. There were, however, quite a few factors which went against the emergence of a liberal movement or a movement for unity. Among them was the fact that Italy remained hopelessly disunited for a very long time. There was lack of a genuine idea, a realistic idea of Italy. There were linguistic differences, there were uneven uh, development in, in terms of both the economy and the society, and there were very significant and discernible regional differences. A second and very major factor was the overpowering presence of Austria. We shall see that between 1815 and 48, Austria had repeatedly worked even against the liberal movements, the movements that demanded a constitution for one thing. So Austria, the, the overwhelming need to drive Austria out of Italy was felt gradually by the Italian nationalists. And a uh, third factor was that though there were certain reforms, the broad character of the restored regimes had been uh, by and large reactionary and somewhat uh, oppressive. They, they often resorted to repression as the response or the instrument to control any kind of movement for liberalization, etc. It is in this context that the movement for Italian unity, to have more liberal institutions, and even the demand to organize United Italy into a republic gradually take shape. The liberal movement, as it took shape between, let's say, 1815 and 48, 
uh, often expressed itself in terms of sporadic uh, revolutions, punctuated by agitation from time to time. The first spate of revolutions came in 1820-21. The first theatre was uh, Naples and, and, and Sicily, Naples, where the Carbonary under General Pepe uh, spearheaded the movement. This revolution, however, was put down by Austria in 1821, early 1821. Then followed a rising in Piedmont, uh, which again was put down by Austria. Uh, we had seen earlier how the concert of Europe was working and Austria was leading the concert to intervene to stop any kind of demand for change anywhere in Europe. The Piedmontese revolt was also suppressed by Austria and now Charles Albert was made the regent and Albert always had a very ambiguous role and was torn between loyalty to Austria and the desire to make Piedmont strong and independent. Thus both the movements for a freer political life in the early period ended in total disaster. The Neapolitan movement failed uh, because of there was lack of coordination, because the European coalition was against them, and also because the Neapolitan rebels did not treat the Sicilians with liberal attitude. Um, that, that is a major point. The Piedmontese movement also failed because it was the work of a small clique which lacked a broad base of popular support and they also had to contend with the hostility of the European powers. However, the instructions were inst the failures were instructive for the future of Italian liberal movement and movement for unity. At this time, Italy lived in comparative peace for about a decade, but the next spit of turmoil came after the July Revolution in France. There had been a spate of popular movements leading gradually to the granting of constitution and a generally changed regime in most of northern and central Italy. Uh, from Paris, a committee of Italian emancipation conducted a powerful propaganda campaign and this had its impact. Constitutions were granted in Bologna, Parma and Modena. Marie Louise of Parma was obliged to flee from her territory. Papal authority was also overthrown. And indeed, the United Province of Central Italy was established in February 1831. Even Louis Philippe, in sympathy with the Italian rebels, sent a troop to Ancona to, to save them. But very soon Austria recovered and sent in troops to suppress all these movements. Massini was the foremost among these, uh, the pioneers of the movement for Italian unity. When Genoa was lost to Piedmont, Massini had a lifelong attachment to the old Republican tradition, the old Republican institutions that Genoa had. He deeply rued the loss of Genoa to Piedmont and particularly the loss of the Republican institutions. Mazzini was an idealist. He had been described by David Thompson as the prophet of the Italian state that was not yet but to be. He, in a way, endowed the quest for this Italian state with a, a spiritual message. He was uh, very well influenced by a whole lot of people. His favorite books were the Bible on the one hand and Dante or, or Shakespeare or Byron on the other. He was also very closely familiar with the works of Goethe, Schiller or Victor Hugo of France. Mazzini gradually emerged as a political agitator. Early in his youth, he was a member of the Carbonary, but he was soon disillusioned with the secret society movement. He went to Marseille in France and in 1831 established what was known as the Young Italy Society. There was also a society called Young Europe. And uh, this was to be an important factor in the making of United Italy. Nationalism was for him, quote, 
the share which God grants a people in the work of mankind. It is that people's mission, the task it must perform on earth so that God's purpose may be fulfilled and good. He saw himself as a successor to the earlier Romes. There has to be a third Rome, successor to the Rome of the Caesars and the Rome of the Popes. The vision of future of Italy that Mazzini conjured in a way stayed with the Italians. It was disinterested, it was passionate, it was idealistic and it influenced a whole lot of people over the next few years. Mazzini is usually credited with having succeeded in creating a sense of Italianness, what they called Italianata. And that's why Mazzini never thought of needing foreign help. He said, Italia fara da se. Italy can do it alone. Italy can achieve her own unity by herself. But to many, Mazzini appeared to be a radical, uh, a mystic, and lacking a practical political sense. So other ideas also emerged. One of these ideas was that of Gioberti. Whereas Mazzini thought that Italy's genius was popular and democratic, Gioberti thought it to be monarchical and aristocratic. And therefore he was in favor of a federation. And his idea was that Italy should be united in a federation under the Pope. This was also supported by people like the Seglio or uh, uh, Balbo to an, to an extent. Their uh, faith was, however, pinned on the ruler of Piedmont. They expected the House of Savoy to lead the uh, movement for unity. Indeed, Balbo in his Speranze d'Italia, he emphasized unity more than liberty. More than uh, liberalism, they, what they were looking for first of all was unity. In this way, the king of Sardinia then also emerged as an, as, as, as an option. So by the 1840s, early 1840s, there seemed to be three options. Popular movement led by Mazzini looking to establish a united republic in Italy, a federation of Italian states under the presidency of the Pope as Gioberti had suggested, or the leadership of the House of Savoy, the ruler of Piedmont, Sardinia, to take the initiative in driving Austria out of Italy and making Italy unified under the House of Savoy. Charles Albert, who we had seen earlier as an ambiguous person, in mid-1840s appeared to have opted for uh, moving against Austria and, and, and this is what he did. He was now inclined towards trying to make Sardinia strong. He was no liberal but he allowed his minister Margherita to introduce a few reforms that would uh, make him a little more popular and, and would allow him to be the effective leader, not just ruler of his people in Sardinia. Now this switching of Albert to the side of liberalism somewhat encouraged the liberals to look for unity once more, to look for the expulsion of Austria once The new Pope Pius IX was also somewhat liberal, but his liberalism was skin deep and, and very soon it was clear that liberalism and the Pope's existence as a ruler were somewhat at odds. Indeed, the Austria very soon got uh, slightly anxious about this and in 1846, in 47, Austria occupied the papal city of Ferrara to put down a liberal movement and that was not very successful. The Pope circularized the powers of uh, Europe and Austria was obliged to move back. Well, this was the context in which the movement of 1848 emerged. And we had looked at the movement of 1848 in Italy earlier. All these three were tried out. The Pope's leadership was not quite in question because the Pope was on the receiving side. 
Albert leading Sardinia Piedmont had certainly tried to take Austria on. He had engaged in two different wars with Austria, was defeated in the battles of Custosa and then in the naval battle of Novara. This for the temporary, uh, for, for the time being, put paid to the ambition of Sardinia to lead the Italian movement. In 1848, the revolutions also indicated popular uh, participation. There had been riots in Lombardy and Austria was obliged to withdraw for some time, but Austria came back. In Venetia, which was under Austria, the popular movement resulted in the establishment of a republic for the time being. This republic was led by Manin and lasted for more than a year. In Rome, there was a popular movement again and the popular agitation ultimately led to the establishment of a republic and the expulsion of Pope from Rome. Mazzini became the head of this republic. Ultimately, the movement combined efforts of Spain, Naples and France destroyed the Republic in, in, in Rome. There was a siege which Garibaldi very heroically held for more than a month, but ultimately the Pope was restored to Rome, the Republic collapsed, and a French garrison sent by Louis Napoleon, who himself came to power in the wake of the revolution in France, to protect the Pope from there. Austria had already recovered and uh, Venice and Lombardy were taken back. The rulers were restored to their central Italian duchies and kingdoms and it seemed that Italian unity for the time being was still a matter for the future. In the next lecture we shall see how between 1848 and 1861 Italy was nonetheless united in spite of this setback.